It's off the Leonard, defended by Simmons. Is this the dagger? Hello and welcome to the Raptors Weekly Podcast. I'm your host, Samson Folk, and today I'll be previewing for you the Raptors Bucks series that we're all very excited to watch after Kawhi Leonard hit that moonshot last night. Joining me today to break down the series, I couldn't think of anybody better except the guy I've had a correspondence with, a writer for the Bucks, Brew Hoop in particular, and a co host of the Buck the Trend pod, Andrew Goodman. Andrew, how are you doing, man? I'm doing great. I'm real excited for the series to get underway. You know, we've done the previews earlier this season between the two teams, and we talk about how it's almost destiny that these two teams are here jockeying for a position in the finals. So, you know, it's going to be a great series. I'm really excited for this to get started. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Well, you messaged me last night. You said, like, congrats, and it was after Kawhi hit that shot. What was your immediate reaction after Kawhi sank that? You know... Just such an incredible shot by such an incredible basketball player. I mean, with Joel Embiid on him, a fadeaway clock winding down. I mean, I was looking at still photographs from that game, and it looked like he wasn't even looking when he got the shot off over Embiid. It just, just amazing. But seeing Toronto's reaction from the crowd, you know, you guys, as much as the Bucks, with you know how much failure they've had the last decade, the Raptors really, really deserved that moment after you know falling short. The last few years in the playoffs, so I was very happy for you guys when he made that shot. Yeah, it seems like karmic retribution, like everything comes around in a in a meaningful way, type of thing. So I yeah, guess you know, from yeah, go ahead. And you you beat. I also just want to throw some shade at Philadelphia that you eliminated them. So <laughs> definitely wasn't too sad about that. That was actually that was my my next question was going to be like, what are your thoughts on facing the Raptors as opposed to the 76ers? Is there more weaknesses you perceive? Like, do you wish the 76ers had gone on? What's what's your take there? Well, for me, I would have preferred to play Philadelphia because they are the worst. Of the, not the worst, but, you know, <laughs> want to put it like that. But I would definitely rather face Philadelphia. They beat Milwaukee, I believe, was in their second-to-last matchup of the season where Philadelphia really went off from three. They had to hit, like, 17 three-pointers in the game and only won by five. So I think Philadelphia is really chance of beating Milwaukee if they ended up meeting, which of course they're not. It's the only way they would get going to beat them is if they have those outlier shooting games. We have JJ Redick, Jimmy Butler, Mike Scott. You have these guys, you know, just raining hellfire from deep. But I think the Toronto Raptors do pose some problems for the Bucks in all these games that they've played. Have really been close ones, except the first matchup of the season where Kawhi and Giannis both sat out. Yeah, it's it's tough to pull from the regular season, I feel, especially since the Marcus Gasol uh, trade changed kind of the whole makeup of the Raptors. Although I'm still looking at this series as the Bucks is the the superior team with, you know, Giannis's ascension this year is it's just crazy the things he's been able to do. Um the last question we'll get from you about the Raptors 76ers series before we move on to the full preview. What's the Cliff Notes version, the the short summary? in your mind, from an outsider's perspective, on the 76ers-Raptors series? Well, you know, for you guys to win that series, playing in Philadelphia is always tough. Philadelphia is a tough team. They arguably have the best starting lineup in basketball. But for me, a key takeaway from the Raptors is that shortened bench for you guys. You know, the Bucks. the Bucks have this luxury. They've done it all season. You know, they're doing it in the playoffs is they have this deep, deep bench, one of the deepest, if not the deepest bench, in basketball. So I was a little interested to see Nick Nurse shorten his rotation. Granted, some of those guys for Toronto coming off the bench have struggled in the postseason, but I feel like to beat a team like the Bucks, you're going to need um, all this help from your supporting cast as you can get. Yeah, it's, it's crazy to think about how stark a contrast there is in the bench units of both of these teams coming up for this Eastern Conference Finals match because like you said, the Bucks, they they rep one of the best benches in basketball, perhaps the deepest even. And the Raptors, 
when Fred Van Vliet isn't going, it starts to look like they have one bench member, especially with OG Ananobi being out with his appendicitis. Serge Ibaka, it seemed he got better every time he got smashed in the face in the series, strangely. But yeah, it looked like a skeleton crew out there, whereas the Milwaukee Bucks, much to the chagrin of writers and fans at times, it seems to me, watching people were upset at times that Budenholzer went too deep with the bench when you want to shorten the rotation. Do you have any opinions on that as far as how it's gone in the playoffs so far? Do you have any qualms with Budenholzer letting the rotation stay long? Would you like him to go shorter more often? You know, I think they're having, they're having so much success is because these guys are clicking outside of game one against Boston. Really, the bench, the bench has just been amazing. It's really all I can think of. You're getting these contributions from George Hill. Pat Connaughton's coming off the bench, giving them huge minutes on both ends of the floor. And then you're also getting Malcolm Brogdon back, who I'm assuming isn't, quote-unquote, 100% healthy. But he did look pretty solid in Game 5 against Boston in limited minutes. So, you know, I really think you got to keep riding with the hot hand in the bench. And it's, it's contrast for me. With Phil, with excuse me, with Toronto, not playing their bench as much because you got to figure some of these guys are exhausted playing, you know, upper thirty, sometimes 40, 40 minutes in this playoff series you guys just had against Philadelphia. Yeah, the, well, that's the craziest thing, right? Is that Nick Nurse declined to match Joel Embiid's minutes to Marcus All's all series, but in that final game seven, both Joel Embiid and Marcus All they shared every second on the floor together, and that culminated in a forty-five minute, eleven second performance for Marcus Hall and now he's going to have to rotate on defense for at least four de- like four games against Giannis Antetokounmpo running at the rim. It's not it's not super ideal, so I totally agree with you saying that you just got to let the bench do it if the bench is doing it. Um you spoke about Malcolm Brogdon, who for me has been one of the most infuriating players to watch as a Raptors fan because it's such a stark contrast the Milwaukee Bucks, especially with Giannis, Brogdon, and Bledsoe, all very physically imposing players, spending a lot of time on ball. And the Raptors having, at least in the regular season when they matched up, Kawhi Leonard didn't spend that much time on ball. It was still mostly Kyle Lowry running the offense. And Fred Van Vliet as well, so diminutive from the point guard position. You have Bledsoe, George Hill, Brogdon. I guess Brogdon in specific, how much of a I guess, a problem do you expect him to play and pose to the Raptors in that way? I think he'll be solid. I don't think he'll cause a problem. But, you know, Malcolm Brogdon, great shooter from deep he has. Sorry to bring this up, but he has hit some big shots in Toronto in the past, a few times this season. So just his ability to knock down the three is going to be huge for the Bucs, open up things offensively. Another thing thing that I don't think he gets enough credit for is how, how effective he is driving to the basket. You know, getting to those left, he has a nice reverse, patented reverse layup that he's had ever since he's been in a Bucks uniform. I don't think he'll be a problem per se, but he's definitely not going to be a guy you want to write off, even though he's missed a decent amount of time. Well, that was that was something I noticed any time they played was Malcolm Brogdon. Not only was he he shot the ball well against the Raptors, of course, as you had mentioned, but he's very effective playmaking when he's going downhill towards the basket. And he dismantled the Raptors quite a few times when they had played just with very swift decision-making. That resulted in nice little pocket passes, spraying it across the court to the corner, or, like you said, going to his patented reverse finish, let's say. And so if, if you don't think he's one of the main problems that the Bucks will pose for the Raptors, who do you think is? What, what are the Bucks going to do that completely dismantle the Raptors defensively at times? You know, I'm going to have to go with Eric Bledsoe here, his ability to get to the rack. When he's getting to the rack rather than, you know, dribbling the air out of the basketball or settling for a jump shot early in the clock, the Bucks are a much better basketball team. He's played all right this uh, season against Toronto, but I believe the advantage the Bucks have is just how tough he is defensively. I think he can really be a nightmare on that end of the floor for Kyle Lowry. Yeah, Kyle Lowry has had a bit of trouble with Bledsoe recently. And then, so I guess you, you've you watched, obviously, some games of the 76ers-Raptors series. The 76ers and the Raptors did a decent job of corralling Jimmy Butler and Ben Simmons away from the rim and forcing them, funneling them towards awkward spaces on the floor. Do you think that Bledsoe will be able to navigate better than, let's say, a Jimmy Butler or Ben Simmons? 
I think Bledsoe, Bledsoe has a really nice distinct ability at kni- knifing through the defense, making these acrobatic passes. And the Bucks, what they implemented with Mike Budenholzer when he got here in training camp is they have these blue squares all throughout the perimeter for each designated player supposed to be there on the perimeter. So also I think that helps when you have a player driving and you have a player in their known spot on the floor. You know, that creates a new chemistry. You know, you can, you know, I'm not advising making these no-look passes, but if you if you're relying on your teammate to be in that same spot where they've been all year, you know your chances are your chances are higher of converting that pass. So I think that's going to be a pretty big advantage for the Bucks. Yeah, I guess another thing I'll go to is we're we're doing a Raptors roundtable for our website, and that mm-hmm. includes you know fielding questions about the Bucks. And one of the questions we field is Giannis could be as terrifying as any NBA player in in history. How does Toronto defend him, and do you think they'll have any success? I have my answer, which will be written in an article, but I'm curious what your answer to that is. Well, you can't really stop Giannis if we're being honest. The best you can do is really pray. But at the same time, Boston did a great job in game one, the walling off Giannis, making life difficult to him. You have to be super aggressive with Giannis from the onset. And if you guys can get OG and an OB back, has it been announced if he's coming back yet? It it isn't. It's still up in the air. It's mostly a feeling thing for like the appendicitis. He just has to feel right at the right time. I think for him. But guys like OG, he's been aggressive with Giannis in the past. Siakam. The, that's really one way you can kind of throw Giannis off. Giannis is a rhythm scorer, so he'll get going as the game goes on. But if you can, you know, bump him off the block, make him uncomfortable, foul him a few times. That's you can't really stop him. But that's one way to quote unquote contain him and he is shooting the ball better from deep in the postseason which is also quite a threatening development especially if you can keep that up for the rest of the NBA not only for you guys yeah so let's say the Raptors play very aggressive aggressive defense they load up on Giannis I know you're a really big fan of Chris Middleton I am as well and I think most people should be he's terrific player how do you feel about more possessions going to Middleton without as much attention if the Raptors decide to guard them that way you know, if the Raptors do wall off Giannis, you're gonna have to, you're gonna need Chris Middleton to knock down his shots. He struggled in the past, the last few seasons against Toronto. He really hasn't performed up to his standard, especially the way he played this season. A lot of that has to do with you know spending so much energy on the defensive end of the floor, chasing Kawhi Leonard around. But hey, if Chris Middleton is knocking down that mid range or corner three pointer, especially when you guys are uh, walling off Giannis, it's gonna be tough. Just because you also have guys like Nikola Mirotic, Tony Snell, even though he didn't really play in round two, can hit the three ball, Pat Connaughton, catch and shoot. So really, if you, you have to pick your poison with the Milwaukee Bucks. And that's why that's why the Bucks ended up beating the Celtics in five games after losing in game one, is they saw how Boston was walling him off. And all Giannis needed to do was make better passes to the guys in the corner. They were open. They're just if they wall off Giannis, the, it's gonna be an open shooter, at least one pass away. So you got to yeah. just really, you know, pick your poison. Well, there's there's no really, that's the thing about basketball, right, is you have one guy, he creates an advantage, and then it's just everybody else's job to to capitalize on it. And a guy like Giannis creates an inherent advantage as soon as he steps on the floor. One thing I'd like to ask you, the Raptors' most run plays for Kawhi in the regular season was the ISO, for Kyle Lowry was the pick and roll. Now, in the playoffs, the most run play for Kyle Lowry isn't the pick and roll, it's the dribble handoff. And for Kawhi, it was the pick and roll. And considering that Kawhi didn't play hardly any pick and roll offense in the regular season, it was something they were saving for the postseason. Is there anything that the Bucks have unfurled in the playoffs that you've been, that's been a welcome sight to you or a bad sight to you? Well, defensively, outside of game one against the Boston Celtics, the Bucks implemented switching on pretty much every defensive possession. And that's a big reason why they were causing, wreaking havoc defensively for the Celtics beat them in four straight games. So once they started switching, the Bucks are one of the most athletic teams in the NBA. So, you, you know, guys are moving freely, you know, contesting shots, creating turnovers, deflecting passes. That's great. Offensively, the Bucks run some dribble handoff. But if the Raptors can be successful in the pick and roll and or pick and pop could be a trouble sign for the Bucks because the Bucks have sometimes struggled to defend that this season, especially with Brooke Lopez. 
he either drops or if there's a shooting five out there, he'll come out to contest. But that's a lot to ask for from a seven footer, especially if you're going to ask him to knock down some threes as well on the other end. Right. And so now that we're talking about the seven footers in the series or people near that height, the Raptors, I guess Raptors fandom, a raging conversation for the past two years has been Serge Ibaka versus Jonas Valanciunas. Who's better? Who has more utility? And then when Jonas Valanciunas was traded, Marcus all supplanted Valanciunas in that role, in that conversation. As we've seen, Serge Ibaka led the Raptors in shot attempts in, I believe, two of the games against the Bucks this year. Who are you more scared of to play a role as a big man in the series, Marcus Gasol or Serge Ibaka? I'm definitely more concerned with Serge Ibaka in the series. That doesn't go against my belief on Marcus Gasol. I believe Marcus Gasol is a tremendous player. He can do it on both ends. Great ball handler for a seven-footer. Great low post scorer. He can shoot. But for me, when you look at how the Bucks play defense, they really encourage that mid-range jump shot. This is Serge Ibaka's forte. This is where he makes his money offensively. He's going to have a ton of of good looks for mid range. And I believe it was the second matchup of the season in the regular season between these two teams where Serge ended up dropping like 30 some points. And a lot of those looks were on open mid range shots. So I think this is going to be a big series for Serge Ibaka. What do you think then? Let's say that Kawhi Leonard, who we all know is a mid range assassin. Let's say Kawhi Leonard starts performing really well from the mid range. Let's say Serge Ibaka does it as well. What do you think the adjustment is for the Bucks? Do they do they leave Lopez off the floor? Do they move to let's say a switching defense where they go a bit smaller at the five? What what's the what's the antidote to you? Well, see, I, I'm a firm believer in you know the math and the math nerds and all that. You just got to trust the math sometimes. And if you're gonna have a situation where Toronto, whether it be Lowry, Kawhi, Ibaka, those guys are you know raining hellfire from mid-range, and you guys are still switching on defense and they're still hitting their shots, it's going to be one of those things you just have to live with it and keep really work off what's been working for you guys, not only in the postseason, but the regular season. So let's say Toronto does end up hitting the majority of their mid-range shots. I I really don't think we're going to see a huge adjustment from the Milwaukee Bucks defensively. That's the thing about the Bucks defense is they'll give up a lot of shots, but they'll also give up a lot of good looks at the rim, but they are one of the best teams in basketball at forcing their opponent to take a bad shot. Yeah, well, that's the Raptors used to have the same defensive scheme. They, they went away from it two years ago. But, yeah, the Raptors, they used to be less aggressive and more into funneling players into easier shots in tougher locations. And the Bucks, they've been really good at that in a lot of ways. I guess the, the thing I want to ask you then is, since we're appealing to trusting the math, the Raptors, who were the best three-point shooting team in the NBA since Marcus Gasol's arrival and have been unbelievably bad in the playoffs. Which version of the Raptors do you, expe- do you expect to see against the Bucs? Do you expect to see Marcus Gasol, Danny Green, Kyle Lowry all reigning from downtown? Or are we going to see Kawhi Leonard on an island with you know the misfit toys joining him, one guy doing decently every other game, but not a, not a very good team performance, I suppose? Well, my big thing is Kawhi's going to get buckets. I mean, Chris Middleton has made life, quote-unquote, difficult for Kawhi in their previous matchups. If you look at Kawhi's field goal percentages against the Bucks this season, they're not great. But at the same time, you know, he's going to get his shots. He's going to get his looks. He's going to get to the foul line. He's going to do it on defense. So I'm, I'm totally all right with Kawhi getting buckets. But, you know, if you're having a guy like Danny Green, who has shot the ball very well in his career against the Bucks, Marcus Saul. Serge Ibaka, these guys, raining hellfire from deep. And Kyle Lowry. Big thing for me about Kyle Lowry's and your guys' series against Philadelphia is he's just missing all these shots that you're so accustomed to and making in the regular season. You know, that trail three-pointer above the break or coming off the handoff. But if Kyle Lowry can knock down those shots that he's been missing this postseason, it could be looking pretty good for Toronto. It could be able to keep pace with the Bucs for sure offensively. Yeah, that's the thing is there's, there's a lot of untapped potential for the Raptors, and that's why that series against the 76ers was so, was so difficult. And the Bucks, maybe as juxtaposition, are showing their ceiling, which is, is much better usually. You know, the Bucks are showing what they're capable of. They completely dismantled the Boston Celtics. So I guess, is it, besides you talked about Kawhi is going to get buckets, Serge Ibaka is going to do his thing from the mid-range, is there any other facet of the Raptors' offense or defense that worries you? 
Uh, Siakam. I love Pascal Siakam. Definitely the most improved player for me in the NBA. Really, the way he's ascended and totally transformed the way he played from last year to this season is just amazing. Really respect Pascal as a player. But I just got to add this tidbit. Pascal, when we had Don Maker, Pascal Siakam is what I thought Don Maker would be at this point in terms of you know skill set and length height and all that but just the way pascal has totally evolved his game has been amazing and you know if he's he's a guy that when he makes big plays the crowd gets into it he really gets a crowd going gets his teammates into it so he's definitely i don't want to say dark horse because obviously in this series because obviously he's a great player but i think he's having a series offensively where he's just playing out of his mind then you know could kind of help negate some of the impact of Giannis into the kumpo so if you're if you're comp or let's say kind of pseudo comp for Pascal Siakam or the re- reverse with Don Maker to Pascal Siakam, who is Pascal Siakam's player comp? Does one come to mind for you right now? Huh. You know, not off the top of my head, but I just I love the way he plays, how much energy he plays with on both ends of the floor. He's you know he's always into it. How old is he? He's uh twenty. He just turned twenty five. So he's he's still got a few years of getting better, but I mean, you obviously I watch Toronto games when they're on national television. But you know, since you guys uh, cover the Raptors, I, let me ask you that question: Would you have a player comp for Pascal? I do. Yeah, Lamar Odom is a very good uh, comp for him. I think he's he's faster, a little less crafty with ball handling, but they're both these lithe, you know, slinky players who were uncanny at how good they are passing. They shoot better than their form would suggest. And they just very creative finishers and durable finishers around the rim. I, I think Lamar Odom is a is a good comp for Siakam. But he has a chance to to rise past where Odom was. Yeah, hey, I used to love Lamar Odom when he was his prime, one of the best passing bigs in the game. And a big thing for me about Siakam in this series is the Bucks they give up a decent amount of looks from the corner three and I know that's a big shot that Pascal's been working on all throughout the offseason you know he's proven to hit that this season so he's gonna have that available to him in this series and if he hey he's knocking it down I mean it's gonna, it's gonna be a tough series for sure yeah there's I if the Raptors shoot the ball well then I think this series could be good if the Raptors shoot the ball like they did against the 76ers I think the Bucks could really run away with it the I guess the last question I'll give you before we get into predictions, and we'll see what else comes up, but if you were coach of the Raptors, let's say you're Nick Nurse, suddenly when you speak, you have kind of a southern drawl, this is what you do, and you're Nick Nurse, how would you guard the Bucks from the outset? Are you dropping on the pick and roll? Are you hedging, scram defense? What are you doing? How do you make them uncomfortable? Hmm. How do you make the Bucks uncomfortable? Well, the thing is, is what we we've seen from other teams previously. It doesn't really it doesn't really matter what you try to throw throw at them defensively. They're going to have these guys. Doesn't matter Nikola Mirotic as well. They're just going to continue shooting from deep. There have been games where they've been like two of sixteen at one point, and you know the camera will pan into Mike Budenholzer during a timeout in the huddle. He's like, you know, you got to look, keep letting it fly. So. You know, you really live and die by the three ball. I'm a firm believer in that. So I'm really not adjusting my defense way too much, predicated on how, how the Bucks shoot it from deep. So that's my big thing is you live and die by the three, and it can definitely come back to bite you for sure if you're the Bucks, and it has in the past, in the regular season, in a few games. Okay, so let's go to this then. The Raptors, at least in the Philadelphia 76ers series, were good at running players off of the three-point line. There was that one game where Tobias Harris went two for 13, and that was a lot of looks to give up to a guy. But in the series, the Raptors are pretty good at running guys off the line. Kyle Lowry, well, Siakam blocked more corner three-point shots than I think 22 teams this year. Siakam, Kawhi Leonard, Danny Green, Kyle Lowry, all very diligent at closeouts and funneling players towards the rim where there could be one of Serge Ibaka or Marcus all waiting. If the Raptors do a good job, of closing out on the Bucks at the three-point line, and suddenly the three-point line isn't as viable for the Bucks as we're used to. What is the counter for the Bucks in that in that scenario? 
Well, that's that's the beautiful thing if you're a Bucks fan is I'm almost certain the Bucks were the best team in scoring the paint in the regular season, so you can run them off the three point line. Good thing you got this guy named Giannis down there in the paint. <laughs> he can, he can dunk the ball whenever he wants. He can get to the free throw line. But also another thing with the Bucks offensively is they're they're a great team at passing the ball around the perimeter. So you can you can drive them off the three point line. But they're either going to get to the basket in the foul line or they're going to try to keep moving the ball around until they get a good look from three. So, you know, once you scramble defensively on the Bucks, I feel I feel but I've also seen it could be a precursor to some not so not so great defensive tape per se. Yeah, that's that's the crazy part, right, is that that was like I alluded to Malcolm Brogdon and how good he is at playmaking downhill his height allows him to make passes that a lot of other people can't off of closeouts, or let's say a lot of two guards can't off of closeouts. Giannis Antetokounmpo, when he starts getting downhill, that's just, that's a nightmare for most teams. And considering that that's the secondary action, what do you do in that scenario? Chris Middleton is no slouch passing the ball either. And Brooke Lopez, I, I think that he has a lot of value. I wrote a big piece like before the season started about how I think the three-pointer Middleton and Lopez will transform the Bucks, And yeah, that's the thing. I ask you these questions and, you know, I want to come away from it going like, yeah, the Raptors, there's, there's a way forward. But if you take away the primary action, you're left with, you know, Giannis Antetokounmpo going downhill and you realize that the Bucks are so good that there really isn't just an easy way to take away what they like to do, that the Bucks, like many teams that are capable of winning a championship, have really good counters to really good defense. So I guess moving away from that, let's let's talk predictions, and then maybe we'll expound upon that when uh, we're pressed on it. But what's your how many games? I'm assuming you're picking the Bucks. Yeah, you know, once this gets published, I'm not gonna have too many too many fans. I might have the city of Toronto come out here to Arizona and chase me down with some pitchforks, <laughs> but. I'm going. I'm going the Milwaukee Bucks in five. This has nothing to do with how Toronto played in their first two playoff series. This, for me, is their lack of depth and how their key guys off the bench really haven't stepped up. We saw Norman Powell and Fred Van Vliet. They really hurt the Bucks, I believe, two seasons ago, two or three seasons ago, when we matched up in the postseason and the, you guys eliminated the Bucks. So, if Toronto is not getting that contribution, from their bench, they're going to be in a heap of trouble. You know, these guys for Toronto, they're playing most starters. And you guys went with a two, two-man two bench in that series against Philadelphia. Most of those guys were playing up, upper 30s, and you got this quick turnaround with game one being on Wednesday. So I think guys are going to be tired. And, you know, playing hero ball against the Bucks just it isn't what you want to do. We saw how that worked out with the Boston Celtics and Kyrie Irving granted Kyrie looked like he had already checked out at that point but you know if you're gonna play hero ball you know I'm not saying Kawhi Leonard is not a great player he's obviously great at that but you can't you can't rely on hero ball to beat the Milwaukee Bucks you're gonna need a damn good team effort complete effort on both ends from the bench and from the starters if you want to beat the Bucks yeah that's well if they're coming down to Arizona to to beat you up then they're they'll have a problem with me I I was asked this question for the round table, and I was a bit cowardly in that way. I, I gave two answers. One was that, you know, if the Raptors, if the Raptors shoot from three like they did after Gasol's arrival, which is over 40%, I said, there's every chance that they can steal it in seven. But then I said, you know, that doesn't seem so likely to me. The Bucks are very good. And if the Raptors shoot anywhere near where they've shot so far in the playoffs, then they lose this thing in five or six. So I decided to find the middle on that, and I predicted Bucks and six there. And that's that's what I'll predict here. As sobering as it is that you know it's Kawhi Leonard makes this shot of destiny, he eats the sun and then takes everyone. But that's I think the Raptors are going to lose this series, which it sucks, but. You know, Giannis Antetokounmpo, much like Thanos, is inevitable. He is all-consuming. and oh, I, yeah, I, I, I feel bad for, for Toronto, you know, after all those years getting eliminated by LeBron. Now, hey, now you guys have to go through Giannis. So. <laughs> yeah, and Giannis, like LeBron, was so capable of crushing fan bases in his own way. But Giannis is 
seems even more visceral, kind of. Like, LeBron, he was capable of throwing it down, but Giannis dunks everything around the basket. Like, he just gets in the teeth of your defense, pump fakes, pump fakes, brings the ball from, like, eight feet out, because that's how long one of his arms is, and just slams on your center, almost seemingly without jumping. And he just, he turns bad possessions into good ones in a way that I really haven't seen a player do. His length provides so many problems, and the Bucks. They've built a hell of a team around them. Yeah, Bucks and six is my take. Bucks and five for you. There we go for the culture. Bucks and six, man. Shout out to Brandon Jennings. <laughs> <laughs> man, what? I guess let's. Have you been a Bucks fan um, for a very long time? Yeah, I've been going to. I'm from Los Angeles, so I've been going to Bucks games when they would come play the Lakers or Clippers since about 2003. Wow, that's so okay, I've seen that's I've seen a lot, a lot, a lot of losing. So take us take us through, and this will be the last thing we talk about for the podcast. Like you said, Brandon Jennings, Bucks and Six. Take us through how you feel as a fan, a writer, going from Bucks and Six out of the mouth of Brandon Jennings, the famed fifty point scorer as a rookie, to the shamed joining China too early in his career. How does it feel to go from him to now the prince who was promised in Giannis? Oh, you know, it's I'm just so elated as a fan, you know, taking out this writing. I've seen so, so, so many horrendous seasons of the Milwaukee Bucks winning, you know, 20 games, 25 games. I was even a fan when a guy named Larry Kristowiak who's now coaching uh, the Utah Utes men's basketball team was the head coach of the Bucks. So there was definitely a lot of misery. But, you know, I love watching Michael Red play one of the best left-handed shooters in the game of basketball, just such a pure scorer. So that was awesome watching him play. Unfortunate that he went down with all those knee injuries, really unfortunate. But then the last really, quote-unquote, sniffing of success for the Bucs was really in that 2009-2010 season, which was Brandon Jennings' first first year in the NBA. You know, the Bucs were finished 46-36. and They were on this super hot streak in the second half of the season, and then about a week before the regular season ends, you know, you have Andrew Bogut totally just break like everything in his arm against the Suns on a pretty, thought it was a dirty play by Amari Stoudemire to push him off the rim. So that was, that was a huge blow. Then you go out and lose to a pretty decently talented Hawks team in seven games where you have to have Kurt Thomas now as your starting center. And Andrew Bogut was having a freaking phenomenal year that season on both ends. And then really since then we had Larry Drew who, was the commander and tank in chief for a season. Then you go from drafting Jabari Parker, who showed a lot of promise. And then of course, typical Milwaukee Bucks luck. He tears his ACL, not once, but twice. Then you also have to deal with, you know, this cardboard box of a person, Jason Kidd as your head coach was, you know, the 25 win seasons were not as bad as watching a Jason Kidd coach basketball team. I (laughs) excuse my language, but I shit you not. Horrible. <laughs> and then you finally get rid, you know, of, of the sickness that is Jason Kidd. And then you bring in this basketball wizard of a coach in Mike Budenholzer to pair him with one of the most transcending talents that we've probably seen in the NBA in the last few decades in Giannis. And just seeing seeing the way Giannis has evolved his rookie season you know, just flashback to his rookie season. Most of his points, I don't know if you guys remember, but a lot of these points he scored were off these, you know, little backdoor cuts, you know, off an assist from a teammate for a dunk or layup, or, you know, he'd get to the free throw line. Did shoot the ball quite well his rookie season. But then after Jason Kidd took over, you know, he told he told Giannis to stop shooting. He gave him the red light. And I think that really that really kind of threw off Giannis's mechanics. And I think that's a still big reason why he struggles jump shooting to this day is you know you can't have someone one year ban him from shooting threes and the next year oh yeah hey you know jason jason says Giannis, you know you got the green light do whatever the hell you want out there so i think those jason kid years you know i don't know why he gets a lot of credit for the way Giannis has developed i think that's just goes with you know Giannis's mentality and his attitude and you know this kid just is always in the gym 24 7 and you you can't teach that so to go from winning 20 to 25 games a season to now being in the Eastern Conference Finals, I really can't even put it to words. 
And I'm sure you feel similar as a Toronto Raptors fan. You guys are finally in the Eastern Conference Finals after these postseason letdowns. So, you know, I think it's great that these two teams are finally matching up to go to a trip for finals. You know, it's great for both fan bases and cities. And you also get the two best players in their respective conferences in Giannis versus Kawhi Leonard. So this is just a win-win for everyone involved. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's no doubt in my mind that if the Raptors lose to the Bucks, I'm still I'm 100% cheering for the Bucks against what will presume what is presumed to be the Golden State Warriors like for the past couple of years I've still cheered for LeBron against the Warriors. And I think provided that Giannis and the Bucks can shoot the ball well, they'll give the Warriors a run for the money if if it gets to that point. And yeah, it's it's good karma for both fan bases and it's it's something nice that there's two likable teams playing each other, whereas, you know, in the West, it's one likable team playing a very unlikable team. Through my eyes, anyway. I'm right. No, I agree. State hater. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's a great way to end the podcast with you pouring your heart out for Milwaukee and, you know, endearing us to you and the Milwaukee plight just as we're about to go to war and uh, hopefully desensitizing ourselves after game one and feeling hate towards each other's fan bases those types of things happen oh, if no, anybody really yeah no, i was just gonna i was just gonna say there's gonna be plenty of reactions from game one regardless of what happens so i'm already kind of yeah. mentally preparing myself for that yeah that's whoever wins that first game the opposing fan base is gonna melt down because of course so yeah if you uh, know how it works if it, yeah, if anybody listening really liked Andrew's takes or his demeanor, you can find his Twitter at Andrew G underscore NBA. Like I said, he writes for Brew Hoop. You can find his stuff there. Or he also co-hosts the Buck the Trend pod. Andrew, thank you so much for coming on, man. Thank you for having me. And, you know, best of luck to you guys. Yeah, best of luck to you too. And for all the listeners out there, have a blessed day. Take care whenever you get around to listening to this. And uh, goodbye. <laughs>